I regret that I don't really know a lot about his teachings, and I'm interested in that question, and also how it fits into perhaps um, the Thai, the larger Thai context, how it how it differs and, and is similar to Ajahn Chah. Uh, and did Buddha Dasa, and I know that he was pretty much self-taught, but did he have a relationship with Ajahn Moon in the way that uh, Ajahn Chah did, or in some way, so any any of that kind of context would be appreciated from from at least myself. Thank you. I don't think I need the mic. Uh, I'm very loud. No, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in um, learning about the contradictions in the Theravada's teachings by different teachers. This will be something I really want to know about because so far I have been maybe just too soft and I embrace just about everything. I, I personally don't want to go into talking about the contradictions of other teachers. I've learned that that's not always a good idea. <laughs> but I'll I'll mention some things that I feel like, um, for example, in response to our topic, I'll bring up at least one possible contradiction. I believe in uh, part of the announcement of this event, uh, there was something I think that you said about um, Buddha Dasa believing in, well, being, believing in socialism but a socialism that's based upon spiritual values and uh, not material values or economic values. Uh, and I, you know, that's a big, a big subject, but can you expand on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his term was Dhammic Socialism. Uh, this topic goes sort of beyond Buddha Dasa, but maybe it's part of your experience, and that is, could you say something, uh, how you reflected on how Buddhism and America mix right now? Um, is Buddhism going anywhere in America, or does it have to transform itself somehow? Uh, not the religion, but the practice. Just meditation practice, for example, is uh, how do you get more people to meditate? I, I was wondering if he uh, had traveled to Burma and, or if not, if he had studied Burmese practices or so forth and what his connection with that was. Um, and, yeah, just what his connection with Burma and their, their ideas about Theravada Buddhism and so forth. Yes, I'm interested in hearing um, some more about Buddha Dasa's, Buddha Dasa's philosophy, I guess, and, and his Dhamma teaching on non-duality and also how he, um, I have the sense from what I've read that he did relate that to not only Theravada Buddhism, but other forms of Buddhism. And so um, I'm interested in hearing a little more about that. Thank you. You mentioned about um, that Buddha Dasa had some innovative or creative ways of teaching. So I'd like to hear a little bit about how Maybe his teaching is is maybe different or innovative, or in some ways, um, you know how how the teaching has changed. Um, what his contribution to the teachings? Let 
interested in um, what he taught for practice, um, specifically the type of practice he taught his students um, relating to um, practice, not just not not the philosophical, but the practical mm -hmm. practice. Do you mean meditation practice specifically, or more broadly? Um, what, however he however he defined it, I would like to know how he defined practice and how he taught taught that. Meditation would be nice, yeah. Because he defined practice very broadly, so we can go in that and the more medi specific meditative aspect of that. I'd like to know more about his approach to jhana practice oh, and um, if that's um, something he uh, talked about a lot or uh, just incorporated into the uh, vipassana approach. Um. This might be somewhat difficult for you personally, but my understanding is that his dying process was quite controversial from a Buddhist perspective. And um, I wonder if you could just give us some background. I mean, some people say he was kidnapped. And oh, I, I originated that word. Oh, that, <laughs> I didn't name any names. <laughs> and that... Um, the medical ethics, I think, are being questioned now in Thailand because many of the doctors are trained in the West, and now they're trying to reconcile it with the, their Buddhist background and this effort to keep someone alive at all costs. I don't think uh, uh, is it, not accepted now, um, and so I just wonder if you would, if you if you can do this or reflect on that process. I definitely can. The, the main issue will be how much time we have. <laughs> okay. okay, and there were two more people who came up during the break, but I'll just speak for you. Is that okay? Um, see if I get this right, is to say a little bit more about the topic for today, Nibbana in the world of the world of life. Is that close enough? His understanding of nature and how that connects with ethics, environmental ethics, things like that. Okay. Hmm. Um. How much are you prepared to hear me talk and talk and talk? Is that okay? Because there's plenty to talk about. So I'll start talking and feel free to raise hands, ask questions, and we'll. And any of you, if there's stuff you've read, or especially those of you who know Thai and have read things that aren't available in English, please feel free to uh, help out. And some of these I can, in responding to some of the things that were just raised, and thank you all for for bringing stuff up. It, for me, it's a big relief to get some sense of what interests you all. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to tie some of these together. And when I do, if anything gets left out, please, please remind me. So I'd like to start with, um, with what Art brought up. Uh, at least how I understood what he brought up. In one of the books that's been published in English, uh, Heartwood of the Bodhi Tree. There's a refrain that is a refrain not only in that book but throughout Ajahn Buddhadasa's teaching for the last, say, 30 years of his life, which is in Pali, Sabe Dhamma 
nalang abhinivesaya. Sabedama means all things, all dhammas, all phenomena. And dhammas here means all natural things or phenomena. Nalang is ought not. Abhinivesaya means Ajahn Buddhadasa once explained it to me as bury one's head in. It's, he took it as roughly synonymous with clinging. Um, it's based in the word of, that can mean dwelling. And abini, abhi is an intensifier like in abhidhamma, it means bigger. Um, although some would say greater, sometimes it just means bigger. Um, not always better. And nivesa can mean dwelling. One of the most famous temples in Bangkok is Wat Bawan Niwes, and Niwes is from this. So anyway, and it means, the way he usually translated it could be rendered into English, either as all things ought not to be clung to, and he would add on as me or mine. Or it could also be translated, nothing is worth clinging to as me or mine. <clears throat> and you can change clinging into attaching or grasping or egoistically holding. This, this, is, um, this is the way that Ajahn Buddhadasa was able to do the synthesis that you're ask that you were touching on. And this quote comes from the Buddha's own, somebody asked him, uh, a layman named Dhammadina, wanted a quick and dirty summary of what the Buddha was about. And the Buddha said, Sabe Dhamma Na Lang Abhinivesaya, at least in my American Thai-influenced accent of Pali. Please don't ask me how to pronounce Pali words. I get asked that and I don't know. I know how they do it in Thailand, but they do it differently in Burma and differently in Sri Lanka. Anyway, nothing is worth clinging to as an Ajahn Buddhadasa really stressed that clinging is about clinging to me and mine. Clinging, or in Pali, clinging to Atta, self, and ataniya, things connected with self. So, he simplifies that as me and mine. That's the core of the Buddha's teaching. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this, there are some other things that are similar to this that run like a refrain through his teaching. Ajahn Buddhadasa produced many books. For quite a while he wrote. He was considered a very good writer. Uh, but since the 70s, most of the books with his name on them are transcriptions. And in these, he did not do as some do where he would comment on a specific discourse and kind of go through it line by line, which is a very traditional approach. And a number of Tibetan teachers have books that follow this approach. He didn't use that traditional approach, but what he did was he would take a theme. Um, I'll mention a few. One is... Uh, Uh, Dhamma and politics is one, or the ABCs of Buddhism is another one, or Dhamma weapons, Dhamma Sastra. Some of these would not be politically correct in certain liberal Buddhist centers, but he, he was uh, oblivious to that concern. So he uses metaphors that some of us are not comfortable with nowadays, like Dhamma weapons. Um, what are some of the other themes? And then a number of books about sunyata, which he liked to translate as voidness, on tatata, which I'll, I'll come back to when we speak of non-duality, uh, a number of books on education, 
he was very concerned with education and so on. So he would take a theme. Sometimes the audience or group that was asking him to speak would be the starting point for the theme. Other times he would come up with it on his own. And then he would follow it through. And basically what he was doing was exploring that theme in terms of another key quote of the Buddha's, which is, whether in the past or now, I teach only dukkha and the utter quenching of dukkha. Dukkha being suffering, if you like, stress, so not completely workable, but not too bad translation. Suffering's not so great either. But that's what the Buddha said. He was only about dukkha and the quenching, or some would say cessation, of dukkha. So that was always Ajahn Buddha Dasa's frame. What does politics have to do, for example, with dukkha and the end of dukkha? You know, many of us would have no trouble talking about the politics and dukkha part. But it's a lot more challenging to consider what is, what kind of politics would be compatible with non-suffering? What kind of politics would support the end of suffering? And Ajahn Buddhadasa would reflect on those. Some of these in rather broad strokes. But for Thailand in traditional Theravada that he was talking about some of these at all was was a big deal. Or Dhamma and ecology or Dhamma and psychology and Freud and what have you. So the frame is dukkha and the end of dukkha and then he would bring in usually in various ways, nothing is worth clinging to. So if something is dukkha, like politics, it's dukkha because there's clinging to me and mine. And and this, this is important, I think, for understanding him, and this is how I think he gets out of some of the intellectual traps of traditional Theravada Buddhism. Because, for example, traditionally Theravada makes a rather stark dichotomy between the world and liberation. And so you'll even find translator, you'll find suttas and translations that talk about revulsion towards the world. And you'll find uh, teachers who speak as if we ought to develop revulsion. And they mean that literally. I don't translate the, the Pali word as nibita. I translate it disenchantment. But some people feel the world is just nothing but suffering. And this isn't the wacko view. This is mainstream view. The world is nothing but suffering. All you can do is get out. Why would you want to be here? And, and that's a very influential view in Theravada. What I think is a more nuanced view is the world is suffering when we take it personally. When we make the world about me and mine, then it's suffering. And there's a lot from the suttas you can quote about this because the Buddha there's a place where instead of talking about suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the path to end suffering, he talks about the same for that Four Noble Truth perspective in terms of the world, the cause of the world, the end of the world, and the path to the end of the world. Is he talking about annihilating the world? Or some change and, and what changes. Ajahn Buddhadasa is the change is it's not like we have to get rid of the world or die and avoid rebirth which is a standard Theravada and Tibetan and Chinese view. That's kind of good old-fashioned Buddhism. 
that the world's the problem, well, we'll we're going to die, so all we have to do is not get born again. And then it's it. And then some bring in some murky notion of, and then you, something, and they can't talk about it because it brings up blatant contradictions, but there's a kind of implication. If one isn't reborn, one sort of is hanging out in Nibbana somehow, somewhere, but nobody talks about that very directly because intellectually it, it's, a, it's a huge contradiction with the teaching on um, emptiness and not self. Anyway, for Ajahn Buddhadasa, those contradictions don't occur because the problem is not the world. The problem is not birth itself, but it's taking these as me or mine. Birth, illness, physical pain, uh, difficult jobs, stress, uh, challenging relationships. It's just all Dhamma or nature. In not only Fraja and Buddhadasa, but something that's stronger in Thailand than other Theravada countries is the notion that Dhamma is nature. Uh, the Thai word for nature is Tamachat, which is Dhamma Jati, Dhamma birth, or Dhamma born, or born of Dhamma. And actually, the Latin nature, I forget the etymology, but it also has something to do with birth. So, <clears throat> the problem is not the world, Prajan Buddhadasa, is the world of clinging. When we're taking things personally, egoistically, as me or mine, it's a world of selfishness. But the same thing, which you can call the world or whatever you want, if there's no clinging, it's no longer a problem. And, and that's, that's the end of suffering. So, so again, the, Nothing is worth clinging to as me or mine. When we get that, we no longer create problems out of society. And so this perspective allows, that opens up a possibility, and we'll come to Dhammic socialism later, the possibility of talking about engaged Buddhism. Those who adhere to the more uh, the the um, very dualistic standard Theravada notion, or it's not just Theravada, it's through all the schools, that the world and Nibbana are completely separate. Although in Zen, they tend not to separate them like that. But those who want to keep a strong dichotomy, it's very hard to for those people to think of a reason why one would waste one's time on the world or society. And so we find teachers who come from that belief, and it is, in my view, a belief. It's not necessarily what the Buddha taught. It's an interpretation. It's hard to, to think about politics, society, relationships, family, as anything but a bunch of suffering. So why encourage it? Why waste your time? Whereas this, again, what I see as a more nuanced approach is none of these things are bodies. Although Ajahn Buddhadasa didn't stress it, we could even say our sexuality, um, society, and for him, a big thing, work, jobs, careers, none of these need are inherently suffering. What turns it into a problem or suffering is me, me and mine. So, so that's at the center of his teaching and at the center of what you could call his hermeneutics. And although I'll come back to it, the practical side of this is 
that when we cultivate mindfulness, the essential thing to be mindful of is, is their clinging. Again, there's a way of understanding Dhamma, and it's not limited to Thailand or Theravada, that assumes we're clinging pretty much all the time. Ajahn Buddhadasa didn't make that assumption. He didn't quite dispute it either. But there's a danger in assuming these things. I think the way to practice this point is not assume that there's clinging and also don't make the mistake of assuming there isn't clinging. I've, I've, well, that's easy to slip into too. But that becomes the core of our mindfulness practice or that's what mindfulness is for. To be training oneself to be mindful moment to moment. Right now, who's doing this? Is there a sense of me doing this? then there's some clinging. It might be a fairly uh, transparent me or it could be a pretty thick, self-centered me. That's something to monitor. And then also to be aware when the sense of me is, is not noticeable. Now then it's real easy to jump to the conclusion, oh, I'm not clinging. Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, and it's funny how our mind will do that, you know, I'm not clinging. And of course, using the pronoun doesn't mean there's clinging, but often uh, it does, or, it, or it, it's there. So it's not about reaching a conclusion about clinging or non-clinging, it's just being mindful of it moment to moment to moment. So in practical terms, this is the core of, of practice. Being mindful of when there's clinging and learning to learning how to let go. I'm just kind of pondering which which things to tackle in what what order. Well, I'll yes. My microphone. Would shunyata then be the antithesis of a me or mine? Moment to moment, if there's no me or mine, is that... Well, in a way you could say it's an antithesis, but also me and mine are empty. So in a way, me and mine are emptiness, we just don't see it. But in the Pali tradition, and here, here's one of the things, traditionally Theravadins don't talk about sunyata or emptiness, voidness, but it actually is quite important in the suttas. And so in, I think this is one of the areas where Ajahn Buddhadasa was unique in all of the Theravada world, in that he talked a lot about sunyata, and um, and coined a word, the empty mind or void. The Thai word is wang. Like if if this if I poured out all the water, the glass would be wang. Um, and he spoke of the empty jeet wang, which means empty, free mind or heart. As a way to talk about emptiness in a what he thought was a more practical way. So, yes, when we realize emptiness, there's, one sees there's nothing to cling to. And when I say realize, moment to moment, if, if in this moment there's realization of emptiness or 
anatta, not self, there's just it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. There's no point in in grasping at something as a self, as me, as mine. But as in the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. You could say the same about the thought of me is it is empty of any inherent existence. There's no substance. It's just a fleeting thought or a sense kind of created out of memory of somebody that, you know, we kind of look back and there's this trail of after images and we take that to be me. And then we project it into the future, which is one of the main functions of ego. But but all of that is empty. Everything is, is emptiness. For Ajahn Buddhadasa, by the way, although he talked about emptiness more than any other of the well-known Theravada teachers, for him, he didn't draw a uh, much of a distinction between emptiness and sunyata and anatta, not self. Some Mahayana people would say there is a difference. And I think that has to come, that comes more from a certain philosophical take, which Theravada doesn't encourage. But I think in practical terms, there's no realistic difference. But when we get into the inner Buddhist politics, then some people feel a need to have, you know, the first turning, the second turning, and the third turning. And us poor slobs are the first turning. So I'd like to pick up on, um, I, I didn't get your name, but Marcy's point because it touches in some of the stuff I've already been bringing up. One of the first things of Ajahn Buddhadasa's to be translated into English is a little booklet. It's still around called um, In Nibbana is or In Samsara is Nibbana. So and from his perspective that I've just talked about, about non-clinging, that dukkha arises from clinging and the end of dukkha happens through non-clinging. And by the way, letting go often is interpreted in the states as like, if you let go of something, you sort of give it up completely. That's not what Ajahn Buddhadasa meant by non-clinging. So, for example, eating, and this is where some of the kind of crude understanding of letting go falls apart. How do you let go of food? Or even more, how do you let go of breathing? And some people who take that sort of materially think, well, I guess you got to stop eating or stop having sex, or get divorced, or quit your job, or move. People are always taking letting go in a rather materialist way. Sometimes that level of renunciation is helpful. But non-clinging isn't about whether you eat or not, live in the city or not, have a family or not. It's about whether we do these things with a sense of self, ownership, possession, control, or me and mine. So along those lines, he, he, he didn't go as far as some people do nowadays and say that Nibbana and Samsara are the same. He, he wasn't a fan of the all is one kind of thinking. 
but he also, and, and I, I appreciate that because all is one becomes a position. And as the Buddha pointed out, as soon as there's a position, you hold to it. And it tends to become my position. And then the people who don't agree with all is one are somehow wrong, inferior, or whatever. So rather than, so he didn't go to Nibbana and Samsara are the same, but he wanted to get away from Nibbana and Samsara are totally separate, which is a fairly traditional approach. So his way of saying that back in the 50s was um, Nibbana is found in the midst of samsara. Or he would, there's a, I think it's a Thai saying, the diamond in the toad's head, pet nai hua kang kok. My Thai accent's a little not so great, but I, I think it works. Anyway, the diamond in the toad's head. And, you know, toads are supposed to be ugly, warty, you get warts and it's... But the diamond is, is right there and there are other phrases from Thai culture that would make this point. And he would use that to speak about we find the end of suffering in suffering. So any attempt to practice by somehow fleeing suffering is is not going to work. Recently I was speaking in Cambridge and somebody brought up this topic and sort of implied that becoming a monk is just fleeing suffering. And I've, I've encountered at least one Zen teacher who was kind of anti-monk um, for that reason. Ajahn Buddhadasa clearly did not share that view and although I'm no longer um, a monk, I, I, I don't share it either. Uh, although I, I've met monks who I think are fleeing a lot of stuff, but so are most people. <laughs> and fleeing it as a monk isn't usually the, the, the nastiest thing one could do with one's life. But the point again is not doing it in some physical escape, but it's getting to the bottom of what what holds us to something. And there's a Pali term, the atsada, the, the deliciousness or the charm of something. And Ajahn Buddhadasa used the word deliciousness a lot. The kwam aret aroi of something. What's the kind of delicious, seductive quality and even things that are painful, difficult, obnoxious, there's something that's the hook. And later in life, he talked a lot about positive and negative, or before that, liking and disliking, or gladness and sadness, delighting and, um, let's see, despising. So he would use a lot of these kind of pairs, like positive, negative, liking, disliking, there's something delicious in that. The Pali word is um, nandi, which means delight. And the Buddha uses it in contexts that aren't just positive things. There's a kind of nandi or delight even in negative things. Um, the, you know, some cultures, uh, kvetching is sort of a pleasure or um, certain personalities um, complaining or criticizing or even anger has got its kind of buzz. So that's what's meant by the delight or the deliciousness. And, and that's part of why, why we cling. We want to hold on to it. We want to keep it, own it, manipulate it. So... So back to Nibbana and Samsara or Nibbana in the world, world of life. If, if we see the world as just a bunch of positive and negative things,
and we like some and we dislike others, then we've created samsara. So notice samsara is created by ignorance. In, in Ajahn Buddha Dasa's understanding. Often in Buddhist circles, samsara is just kind of tossed off as the description. Well, it's just samsara. And it takes on a, a more material meaning. <coughs> Society is just samsara. Family life is samsara. Uh, the workplace is samsara. Politics, it's all just samsara. And I, I think the point can get lost that samsara is created out of the the mind that doesn't doesn't see impermanence, doesn't see selflessness and emptiness, doesn't see the dukkhaness of of positive and negative. But again, if Seeing things in terms of emptiness and non-clinging, then one no longer has to assume that life or the world is is samsara or is dukkha. Often in the Pali, it's vata samsara and the cycles of samsara that's traditionally explained as the cycles of birth and death and it's interpreted in a traditional rebirth way. After, after someone dies, they're reborn in some realm. And it's, it's, it's like with born-again Christians who assume they're going to heaven. Most of the Buddhists who believe in this assume that they're going to have a pretty good rebirth. But in the suttas, you know, the metaphor of the Buddha is the turtle that comes up from the bottom, the blind turtle at that, who comes up from the bottom of the ocean once in a hundred years. And what's the odds of the blind turtle in the huge ocean, you know, having its beak go through a little hole in a piece of driftwood? Or even if it was a life preserver, the odds are still not all that good. And that's just getting a human birth, let alone a you know, a heavenly one. So it's kind of funny. The traditional Buddhists who assume that we're going to be reborn tend to overlook the part that says the odds of a good rebirth are not that great. Unless you're like Soda Pana or something. So, for Anjan Buddha Dasa, rebirth, and I'll say more about this in the afternoon, was less about being reborn after you die because the, and I'm going to be very careful in my wording here, because the usual ways of speaking about rebirth imply a self. And Ajahn Buddha Dasa thought that was a major contradiction. Um, he did not, however, flat out uh, deny the traditional understanding of rebirth but he preferred to think of birth. And in the Pali, the word is actually usually just birth. Um, talk about birth, or there's another word, renewed existence. But rebirth doesn't actually appear in Pali um, or reincarnation. But he thought of it more of the birth or rebirth of me and mine, of thinking and experiencing things in terms of me or mine or taking things egoistically. For, um, so I, I want to kind of ground this a little bit. His you know, he had monastic students and he had so-called lay students or the, the usual term in Thai and Pali means householder. And he thought it was the same for everyone that whether one's lay or ordained, 
suffering happens not because you're lay or because you're a monk, but because you're clinging to whatever the conditions and realities of your life as me and mine. And to extrapolate on that, suffering is not because of one's profession. And he, he liked to, another phrase he liked to talk about is nothing is worth being or having. In the dependent co-origination teaching, uh, the piece about birth is connected with the term becoming or being, which in Pali is bhava. So he liked to say nothing is worth being or having, nothing is worth becoming. Which means if one is a monk, just do the what he would call the natural duties of a monk without conceiving of oneself as a monk. And the same applies to school teachers, doctors, hairdressers, um, whatever, whatever one does. And then one can look at that. If we look around, we all play many roles. You know, even, even a monk is in some cases more a student than a monk, or a son, or a, a daughter, or an uncle, or an aunt, or a counselor, or a teacher. There are many roles that all of us play, parent, spouse, friend. It's when we latch on to that role, instead of just doing, and he, he likes to use the word duty a lot because it's one of the meanings of, of dhamma or dharma. Whatever the duty of the moment is, in AA it's called the next right thing. Whatever that duty is, just, just do it freely and without clinging. But when we cling to, I'm a husband, I'm a teacher, I'm celibate, I'm not celibate, I'm lay, I'm whatever, then ego starts to grow. And the ego will be, will spin off into greed, hatred, anger, aversion, irritation, fear, delusion, pride, envy, and so on. So I'm, I'm trying to pull together a lot of things and hopefully it's not too much too fast. His, he felt that the Buddha's message was that we, as long as activities are basically ethical, and for him Buddhist ethics boils down to non-harming, if our way of making a living, whether it's wandering for alms or he came from a merchant family doing business but always being fair or if one is a civil servant and draws a salary as long as it's fair and honest and one is honest about doing one's job, none of those need be a basis of suffering. It's, again, the clinging to who I am, what I want, what I like, what I don't like, that, that creates suffering. Um, before I move on to another topic, is that getting into, is that shaped out enough? Okay, okay. I, I won't flog it too much. And those were a, a few of the contradictions, maybe, at least how he or I see them. Okay, 
got about 10, 15 minutes. I'll, let me approach the question of nature and ethics because I've, I've brought it up a, f a few pieces of that. Culturally, in the Thai understanding of Dhamma is very much connected with, with nature. As a culture and people, traditional Thai life is associated with the forest and the rice fields and some, some body of water. For much of the country, rivers and streams, but for the part of the south where he was from, also the sea, because his, his village was on the coast and there were mangroves all around. And lots of what in the south are called klong. In most of Thailand, a klong is a canal, but in the south they're, they're like a river. And uh, because Thai, southern Thailand's a very thin peninsula with um, a mountain range down, down the middle, the rivers are all very short. They just kind of come. And, and then when they get close to the ocean, there's, they wander and branch off in the mangroves. That was where he grew up. But throughout Thailand, Dhamma in nature are closely associated. It's similar to Tao or Tao in China. And this is a way that Thai, Thai Buddhism and some aspects of Chinese Buddhism are similar. It's not a direct influence of one on the other. It's just the cultures. A Thai is not a Chinese language. It's an independent language family. It's not Indo-European either. Uh, but it's, it's a similarity between the cultures. So, Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to emphasize the connection between Dhamma and nature. And he would do this in both Thai and, and English. So, he would teach that Dhamma is nature. Nature is Dhamma. It's, that's for him one of the main meanings of, of Dhamma. Dhamma is nature. So that has a lot of implications. Some Thai environmentalists consider him to have been an important early inspiration for the Thai environmental movement because he was talking way before Western environmentalism had an impact in Thailand. He was already talking about how if the destruction of the forests continued, Thailand would be in big trouble. And he saw this as not just an envir a physically environmental issue, but a culturally and ethical and spiritual issue because of the connection between Dhamma and, and nature. The way I come to understand this is when we're in the usual world of human artifice, everything, like on, in this room, for the most part, everything here has been put here by human design. And this space less than many but probably still here as well, when it's human design, there's often human desire behind the design. It's very hard for us to do things, especially in groups, without our agendas coming out. And so when we're in human environments, there's going to be a lot, not everything. And but a lot of stuff that is coming out of craving, greed, anger, fear, confusion, and so on. 
nature's not quite the same. When I used to like to do walking meditation at night in the woods, just kind of be with the trees. You know, and trees don't put themselves forward the way we do. And they don't shrink. You know, some of us are putter forwards and others are shrinkers and some wobble between the two. It's just trees and ants. You know, they they do their thing, but they're not doing it through the mechanism of the ego like we are. They don't have the agendas. Although we are nature too, our cities, all our creations are also nature. What um, what we in the West would call the natural world is a place where it's much easier to remember or recognize that it's all nature and that things can function quite nicely <coughs> without the usual craving and agendas. Although deep down most of us don't believe that. You know, the me really wants to be in control or find somebody we can trust to be in control. Or, you know, pin it on somebody else so we can blame them, blame them because sometimes we're too cowardly to take responsibility like with our politics nowadays. There are a lot of things we do and craving keeps coming in. So, to have environments where the role of human artifice is very low. In some forest monasteries, it's extremely low because everything is so simple. Others, there's more. And increasingly, the temples are taken over with the usual modern stuff. This is not intended as a blanket rejection of modern technology, but an attempt to find some balance so that there's enough in our lives that on a daily basis, and, and not just ideally, not just for a few minutes, but consistently we can be with things that aren't operating on and through ego. So that's a, a big piece of the connection between Dhamma and nature. But the way Dhamma is also used is in terms of truth or law. So Ajahn Buddhadasa also talked a lot about the law of nature. And the Pali word for this is Dhamma Niyama. And there is an, an abstract noun, Dhamma Niyama Ta, the lawfulness, the natural lawfulness of things. And this is Dhamma Niyama Ta is sometimes used to refer to impermanence. So it's a perspective of the Buddha that impermanence, it's not somebody's idea or creation, it's just the natural way things are. It's natural truth or if you like, natural law. And the same with the dukkhaness of things. That things that are impermanent fall apart, are uncertain and unstable, the law of entropy, you know, it takes to hold some order together, takes energy. And so there's a, a natural stressfulness in this. This is also part of the way things are. But the natural stressfulness doesn't necessarily mean suffering. I'll maybe follow that up in the afternoon. Um, because that was another important thing for Ajahn Buddhadasa. The word dukkha does not always mean suffering. Uh, and if we, if we don't get the nuances in the way dukkha is used, it's very confusing. So, but back to dukkha as a law of nature is the inherent instability, undependability, 
and stressfulness of impermanent stuff and their emptiness or their their lack of an abiding self is also natural truth. But most of all, he'd like to talk about the law of nature in terms of conditionality. The Pali word is itapajayata. Um, should I... Do you care to have the spelling of these? I'll write them on the board in a little while. Itapajayata means more or less conditionality, that everything that happens, happens dependent upon causes and conditions. And this is what Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to speak of the most as natural law or the law of nature. A third meaning of Dhamma, which I touched on, is that within nature and the natural conditionality of everything. And nature and what we call the universe are the same thing. Um, And there's nothing unnatural in the perspective I'm, I'm presenting. It's all nature, even the bad stuff. Uh, There's nothing unnatural and there's nothing supernatural. It's all Dhamma, it's all nature, it's all subject to natural law or truth. And therefore, in every moment, everything, or we could say every expression of nature has a a duty. Or for inanimate or um, non-sentient things, you could say a a function. Causes and conditions mean that in each moment there's there's a duty or a responsibility. And this this is also one of the core meanings of Dhamma. Ajahn Buddhadasa thought it was the original meaning of Dhamma in India, predating Buddhas by thousands of years, that going back into the Vedas that dharma meant duty. And in the caste system, that's how dharma is used. Your dharma is according to your, the caste you were born into. That, um, I think it's time to break for lunch, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and we'll pick up how that perspective on dharma and nature is the basis for Ajahn Buddhadasa's understanding of ethics or sila, which is the Pali word that comes closest to to ethics or morality. So, time for one question if there's anything uh, urgent. Otherwise, the duty may be to eat Mike? The way you're using duty then is not as obligation but as functionality. Right? And responsibility. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, obligation is involves clinging. And it, it needn't. It can, but it doesn't have to. The way I'm using the word. But the thing is, there can be a moment of just clarity of seeing what what's to be done. But so often, as soon as we move, we we cling to I as the actor. So we tend to cling to our responsibilities. But what Ajahn Buddhadasa tried to get us to see is it's possible to just respond naturally without without requiring the me. Our way of thinking so often assumes there's no action without a doer. For him, or he would say in the Buddha's teaching, it's actually the opposite. We cling to the action and thereby give birth to 
the actor. But the actor is not there. And, and this is also the kind of secret to karma. So back to the synthesis, this is, these are the things that pull it all together in Buddhism. And if, if we don't get this, then it, it doesn't quite hang together. Because we get, we get karma teachings that are all about me and mine most of the time. And the Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to point out that the Buddha actually taught, the Buddha's teaching on karma is the end of karma. Or the karma that ends karma, which is a term the Buddha used for the Noble Eightfold Path. Shall we take a break? <laughs>